I'm going to start out today with some quotes for you. Dr. James Montgomery Boyce is one of my favorite commentators. He wrote a book about that thick on the Sermon on the Mount. He has a lot to say about the, the Bible. One of the best commentaries on Genesis I've ever read. He's really, really good. In 1972, he made this statement. There's probably never been a period in history in which the best of men of the time have not recognized the need for telling the truth. It was in 1972. I, that's a special year. That's when I finally graduated from high school. Long time ago, that was over 50 years ago, since then, truth has left much of our culture and society. The average person lies twice a day. That's certainly a lot to me. Lies twice a day. Jesus identified himself as the truth. Dr. Boyce goes on to talk about what other people have said. The great Roman orator Cicero once said, nothing is sweeter than the light of truth. Chaucer, the English poet, wrote, truth is the highest thing that man can keep. English critic John C. Collins wrote with some wit, Truth is the object of philosophy, but not always of philosophers. Daniel Webster once mused, there's nothing so powerful as truth and often nothing as strange. Even the Jewish rabbis, in spite of their system, were ambivalent enough to say that there are four things that shut a person out of the presence of God. One is scoffing. Two is hypocrisy, three is slander, and four is lying. Our text today is going to be Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 to 37. Years ago, I was greatly blessed by a very wise man. His name was Tracy Coker. When I went to Lake Point Baptist Church, he had two twin boys. I think they were ninth graders at the time. You know how ninth graders are. They needed lots and lots of supervision, lots of love, lots of training, and lots of correction on a regular basis. He was doing the best he could as a single father. And uh, I was able to come along beside him and help with the boys some. I've realized you cannot outgive God. I gave special attention to his kids, but as time went by, he became a very, very close friend. He was one of those people that could do just about anything, and he was licensed to do it. He'd passed the bar. He was an attorney. He had his insurance licenses. He had his real estate licenses. He had his car dealership licenses. He just had a whole lot going on, and he was very successful in the oil and gas business. And we got to be good friends. When I was in seminary, I thought I wanted to buy and sell European sports cars, BMWs, Mercedes, Porsches, and Jaguars while I was putting myself through seminary. And I started working on this. I found this guy. He was a wholesaler. He had about a dozen guys around Dallas that he would find cars, sell them at a good price. He put them in perfect condition. It was an easy sale. They were priced right. They were in great shape. They used, some of them had some warranty on them. And he would, he would have them available. So he didn't have to advertise. He didn't have to have a lot to keep them to sell them. He was a wholesaler. He had these guys. I found out about him when I went to purchase my first little BMW. My wife and I decided we'd both be happy with a little bitty BMW 320i. So I bought it from an, an attorney named Sam Enrick. When I got to close the deal... I noticed on the title, it says I was buying it from Texas Auto Wholesale. And it's like, whoa, I thought I was buying from an individual. And he said, well, I am an individual. I said, why is it titled to Texas Auto Wholesale? He said, well, I know this guy, Larry Reek, who owns Texas Auto Wholesale. I've been doing this with him two or three years. I'll buy a car. I'll drive it. 
for a month or two or three and sell it. And basically, I'm driving nice cars for free. And I thought, could I do this? And he said, well, here's the guy's card. I met with him. I said, could I do this with you? He said, sure. I said, how do we do it? He said, you bring me the money. I give you the car. When you find a buyer, uh, we'll keep it in my dealership so you don't have to pay sales tax twice on it. Drive it for two or three months, sell it, come back and get another one. Bring the money. Well, I didn't have that kind of money. So I started going to banks. Every one of them, I went to banks for a year. I thought, hey, I'm not in debt. I've, I've, I've never been late on payments for anything. Can I borrow some money? And they said, you don't have any credit. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you've, you've got to show that you can pay money back and you don't do that. You just pay cash for things. I thought, is something wrong with that? No, that's great, but you can't get credit. Finally, I went to a last ditch effort, went back a second time to a banker. I'd seen him months before. He said, we can't do it. And I said, you're representing three or four guys with Texas Auto Wholesale. You know the owner of the company. You know the business. Could you help me out here? And he, he said, well, I, I don't know how. Uh, you just don't have the credit we need. I said, what would I have to do to get the credit? He said, bring me a certificate of deposit. So I talked to my friend, Tracy. And he said, I'll put up a, a certificate of deposit for you. Not a problem at all. So he gave me his financials. I took him to the bank. He was more than qualified to get credit. And so based with his certificate of deposit, they let me borrow money. But I asked him, I said, how long do I have to do this before we can drop the CD? He said, I tell you what, stay with us for a year. Always make your quarterly payments on time or sell the cars before the quarterly payment comes due, and I'll drop the CD. Six months, he said, hey, you're doing great. I'll drop the CD. And I said, could I keep the CD and apply it to another $15,000? And he said, you can have another $15,000 without the CD, but I'm going to hold you there for a while. I've seen too many people get over their heads, We'll give you 30000 to play with. You can get a couple, two or three cars if you play it right at a time. That's enough for now. Is that all right with you? And I said, that is great, sir. Thank you. I learned so much from this man. First, he trusted me. And you know, when tr people trust me, I have a tendency to trust them back. He taught me a lot of things. One of the things he said, and it goes back to the days we look at when we come back to Matthew. The religious people were not necessarily the good people. And he told me, I've learned through the years, when I walk in and somebody's got a big Bible on their desk that looks conspicuous, it's hard for me to trust them. He said, I've known so many people that are always talking about God and Christianity and the Bible and they will cheat you and lie to you and steal from you. I've learned to watch out for those people who are too vocal about their faith and try to convince you and sell you on themselves up front. And another thing he said, it was a little bit crass, but I think it's true. He said, when you've just met somebody in business and they tell you, I'm a Christian or I'm a virgin, he said, you're about to get screwed. And I thought, you know, that's, that's kind of, there's probably some truth to that to some extent. That would be strange things to say early in a conversation. So let me read this scripture to you, and then we'll talk about what Jesus was dealing with. Before I read the scripture, I know some of you here for the first time just want to catch you up on where we've been. We started something called the Sermon on the Mount. It's probably for sure Jesus' best known sermon, and probably, in my opinion, his best. This would be the best of Jesus. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, three chapters of it. First, he gives us eight Beatitudes, and he's telling people how they can really, really, really be happy with a happiness that's deep and cannot be taken from them. He's trying to tell us how to think and how to feel. And then after he gets to those, he says, now, you guys that I've taught you this, you are the salt and the light of the world. Now go, share this with other people. He sends them out. 
but he knows this crowd he's speaking to. He's on the he's on on the side of a mountain. He's teaching this crowd. This crowd were Jewish people, and the Jewish people were led by the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. And the scribes and the Pharisees were people that were very prominent, high-profile, highly respected people, but they drifted away from what God originally intended. And they had brought down God's standards to a lower level. And Jesus then said to the crowd, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Well, they didn't know what to think of him. He was healing sick people. He was feeding masses of people. He was walking on water. He's a pretty impressive guy. He's done a lot. But they wondered, is he just going to do away with all the law, the Ten Commandments, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the traditions of our forefathers? He said, not at all. I came to fulfill that. So this is what we're into six different statements where he says again and again, you have heard it said of old, but I say to you. What he's talking about, this is what you've grown up with. This is what you've heard from the rabbis. This is what you've heard the scribes, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees say to you. But they've brought it down where they don't need a Savior. They don't need a Messiah because they've got these Ten Commandments. And if they can keep those commandments on the outside, if they can avoid murder, if they can avoid adultery, if they can avoid these things on the outside, they're safe. And they think they're fine with God. They're not. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. They thought their actions were enough. Jesus comes along and said, mm -mm, mm -mm. your attitudes have to be right. And if your attitudes are right, then your actions will take care of themselves. But you can't change your heart. You're going to have to have me. You're going to have to have a savior. You're going to have to have supernatural power to measure up to God's standards, which you've already blown. So I'm going to give you another chance. We're going to call it grace. So Matthew chapter five, we're only looking at verses 33 through 37 today. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. Well, we look at this and it's going to raise some questions. Jesus is coming not to abolish the law, but to, to fulfill it. Now, we know that God has made oaths to people. And this word oath, horkos in the Greek language, basically means to bind to something to make it stronger. So an oath would make things stronger. So God's talking to Abram, and Abram's having trouble. He's got a huge, huge, huge problem. He is now a very, very old man with a very, very old wife, and they still don't have any children. And more than anything, he's a very wealthy man. He wants a child. He wants somebody to leave it all to. He's got this huge problem. And one night God says, look up. And they looked up into the near eastern sky. There were no street lights. There were no city lights. There were no house lights. There probably weren't any candles burning. It was just a black sky spotted with stars everywhere. Stars like we'll never see in the city of Dallas. The sky was absolutely full of them. And he said, your descendants will be greater than the stars in the heavens. And Abram was like, could, could you help me out a little bit? 
could you could you promise me? Could you swear? Could you give me an oath somehow? I I'd love to believe that. I just are you really serious, God? Are you really gonna give me more descendants than the stars in the heavens? And God said, Yeah, let's work together here. Sacrifice an animal, put it on the altar. So Abram did that. And then he waited and he stood out there by the altar all day long. All the scavenger birds were flying around. He had to chew them away because it looked like a free lunch to them. So he runs them off. And then God consumes the offering with fire just to convince him that God was serious. It's like, yeah, yeah, I won't just tell you that walk off. Let me show you something. I'm with you. I have the power to do it. I'm capable. You might remember Noah. God promised Noah with a rainbow in the sky. I would say that bounds something pretty significant, and we still see it to this day because God does not lie. He promised, I'll never destroy the earth by flood again. Marriage vows are a good thing. What Jesus is talking about here when he says, just don't swear at all. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. He was trying to say, tell the truth. Just tell the truth. Most people don't. I look back at my own life. Yours may be very much the same. The biggest heartache and terrors I've ever had in my life have come because somebody did not tell the truth. If you've ever been in a marriage that comes undone, somebody probably made you some wonderful promises that they didn't keep. Sometimes people just don't do what they'll say, that, and that brings a lot of pain and suffering to the world. Jesus was the truth. He always told the truth. He calls us to do that. And why? Because of words. Words, we're going to look at three things today. We're going to look at the power of words. We're going to look at, because they're very, very powerful, we're going to look at how world, words will defy you. And we're going to look at words and how they direct you. Words are powerful, defiling, and directional. I just happened to be in a conversation with some people this week, and they were just talking about the power of words. And why are words so important? Well, hmm. we go back to the very beginning, and God spoke all of creation into existence. Words are creative. You look at David. He understood this when he went up against Goliath. Here's this young shepherd boy, this gigantic professional warrior over nine feet tall. And David looks up at him and says to him, this day, I'm going to feed you to the birds of the air. The New Testament, there was a lady who had suffered for 12 years with a bleeding disorder. She was ceremonially unclean. She was an outcast. She'd spent all her money, suffered at the hands of many physicians, was not getting better. And one day she heard about Jesus. And she said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. She took action. She risked her life. She could have been stoned to death on the spot because she was ceremonially unclean for touching other people, for not crying out, unclean, unclean. And the crowds were pushing in. She managed to get in there and touched his hem. He felt it. Jesus felt power leave him. Words are so powerful. And then we look at how John describes Jesus. Now, when we're studying the gospel, especially in Matthew, Matthew presented Jesus as the king. Matthew says he's the king. He's got a kingdom. The kingdom is finally here. He's our king. This is what his kingdom's like. It's righteousness and peace and joy. In the gospel of Mark, Mark presents Jesus as a sufferer. He did not come to be served, but to serve. You get to Luke. He presented Jesus as the son of man. John presents him as the son of of God. 
And then in the beginning of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He presents himself as the way, the truth, the life. He presents himself as the Word. Proverbs 18, 21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So when we consider the power of the tongue, I'd like for you to consider not only can you avoid trouble by not saying the wrong things, you could say the right things. Words are so, so powerful. And so many times we don't realize what we're doing to ourselves. We often curse ourselves. Many, many years ago, I remember Dr. Derek Prince. He was a professor for over 50 years at Cambridge University. He was probably the world's leading authority on demonology and deliverance ministry, a powerful man of God. And one day after his first wife has, had died, he was with his fiance and they were on the beach. And she said, oh, Derek, would you pray for my legs? They just hurt so much. And he knew because she had trouble with her knees, he laid his hand, she's sitting on the beach, puts his hand on her knees, looks at her knees and said, knees, I love you and I thank you and I bless you. And I thank you that for every single step of her life, you have supported her and held her up. In Jesus name, amen. And she said, that's the weirdest prayer I've ever heard in my life. And he looked at her. He's very gifted prophetically and said, do you remember the first time you cursed your legs? And she kind of went ashen and thought, oh, my goodness. When I was a seventh grader, I was in the girls locker room. We we're all changing clothes. We we're taking our school uniforms off, putting our gym clothes on because we we're about to have physical education class. And I looked around the room, and so many of the girls in that class were good athletes. They had shapely legs. They, they had definition in their muscles, in their calves, uh, in their thighs. And, and they just had beautiful legs. And I thought, I hate my legs. They're just dumpy looking. She cursed herself. Well, I realized, used to, and I gave up sports and in high school, played in junior high. And when we were not playing football or track or tennis, we had to run the power lines. Fifth period athletics, we'd have to go run five miles, get back, shower up, and be ready to go in 55 minutes. So we had to push it a little bit. And I just hated those runs because something always hurt. And I used to just curse my knees or my ankles or whatever was hurting that day. And I learned from that story the power of words and rather than curse what hurts or curse what's not working so well, I try to remember to bless it. I spend lots of time blessing my neck, my back, my hips, blessing my body rather than cursing myself. Words are so powerful. We're going to look at some other scriptures in Matthew about this, about the power of words. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, it says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. Now we're going to see this word bad shows up another time in Ephesians 4, 29, we're going to talk about this word, but it's a word that was typically used to describe vegetables or fruit. Have you ever had a really, really, really good peach that's just perfect? Yeah, some of you have been there. You would remember it if you'd had one that's really, they are so good. 
but it's tricky. If I buy peaches at the grocery store, they've probably been harvested a little bit early. They've been refrigerated. They've been hauled around. And by the time they get to me, I have to take them home because they're hard as a rock, put them in a brown paper bag. Remember that I put them in a brown paper bag. That's where the problem usually lies. And in days, they'll get to that place of sweetness and perfection but then they start to decline they start to corrupt they start to become unhealthy and you slice them up and they're half brown and it's like ooh, not going to put that in my mouth but you might find a little bit that worse keeping but they're starting to go bad same thing with avocados they're rock hard when you buy the grocery store you got to hide you got to wait you got to remember and then get them at the right time then you can put them in the fridge but if they're just right they're soft and firm and tasty and if you let them go too long they start getting gray and brown and just nasty this is the word gray and brown and nasty unhealthy corrupt and then jesus says he's talking to the religious people you brood of vipers that's a pretty bad thing to call somebody how can you speak good when you are evil for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Verse 36, and I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word ever spoken. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. So this is how we come to salvation in Jesus. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, he will be our Lord and Savior. It starts with confession, confession unto salvation. So what we say is very, very important. We go to another passage in Matthew. Chapter 15, verse 18. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. This is a theme we keep seeing. It's not what goes into you. It's what comes out of you that will defile you. And so we look at how words can defile us. So important. I go back, I go back to years ago, one of the so, sig most significant days of my life. I met a mentor in psychology. His name was Dr. Harvey Davison. I'd never heard of the guy before. His name came to me supernaturally from three different friends that were not connected to each other. The third contact that mentioned him said, hey, I'm working with the psychologist as a youth minister with all the teenagers and parents you counsel all the time. He's amazing. He simplifies things. He gets fast results. And it's, there's a seminar this weekend for professionals, but we got some seats available and you can go for free. Ding, 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 free. Operative word for a youth minister. I thought, can't turn down a free seminar like that. I went, I got to know him today. That one day in 1985 was the most fascinating day of my life. A friendship developed. He mentored me. I would use this for free with people in the church as I counseled with them. If I got stuck, we'd go see him. They'd pay him for a 45-minute hour of his time. He would tell me how to get them unstuck, and how to continue to help them. We did this for about eight years. I finally realized I have got to deal with my own stuff. I was about to get married and thought she deserves better than I am. I've got to deal with my own ugly, evil ways, so I scheduled that. The first time I went in to see him officially as a client, he said, well, I'm so glad. It's really best that you sit in that chair before you sit in this chair. But I've heard you've really helped a lot of people. So I'm glad you're here today. Let's, let's rock on. So we had a few sessions. When we came to that last session, it was a very emotional, hard time. 
And I went deeper than I'd ever gone before. I went to the depths of my emotions, lots of hurts, lots of pain, lots of difficult things. And when we finally finished, I looked at him. I said, Dr. Davison, is there anything else I need to do? And he said, no. And I said, will I really be different? And he said, yes. Third time's a charm. One last question. Are you sure? And he said, yes. That's when I learned the power of saying yes or no. Have you noticed how sometimes you ask people direct questions, you get very indirect answers, and they're all over the map? The Scripture teaches us where words are many, sin is not far away. This is the power. Jesus is saying, hey, you don't need those oaths. You don't need to swear. Because simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you become the kind of person that can give people straight answers, you will be more trustworthy. You'll be following Jesus. And the truth usually doesn't need as many words as things that are not. So we see the power and we see how we can defile ourselves. Peter defiled himself. You remember the situation they had had the first communion and Jesus girded himself and washed their feet. He said, this is my body that's broken for you. Take and eat. This is my blood that's shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take and drink. They had communion and then they went out of that place. That's when they came and they arrested Jesus and they took him away. The disciples scattered. They were afraid for their lives. They knew they were probably going to kill Jesus. He was in court, and he went through a couple of kangaroo courts. He was in court. Peter was close. He didn't stay with him, but he was staying as close as he could muster his courage to do. And this is what we find in Matthew chapter 26. This is what Peter did. Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. Now, an oath, keep in mind, the word oath means to bind something and make it stronger. So with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up, bystanders, so people were kind of starting to surround him, came up and said to Peter, certainly you two are one of them for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And you know the rest of that passage. And he went out and wept bitterly. Why? He had defiled himself. Words are powerful. Words can be defiling, and words are directional. Now we're going to go to James. In fact, before we go to James, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 29. Now when we're talking about bad fruit, that word could be corrupt, unwholesome. This translation says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those to hear. 
So with words being so powerful and they can be defiling, this is such a good reminder of how we should speak to other people. This is what our conversations to be like. This is a real challenge. It's so easy to talk about things that don't fit this description. Let me go through it again. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only something that fits these three descriptions. Only as it's good for building up. When you talk to people, whatever you're saying should build them up. When I was in college, we just thought it was good to roast each other and to give each other a hard time. And we were constantly tearing each other down. We did it in what we said for fun and good humor. We really loved each other. We just liked to keep everybody humble. It was so negative. It did not produce good things. It did not build people up. I try to be more careful of that now. As fits the occasion, it's going to be the right thing in the right way at the right time that it may give grace to those who hear. This word for grace is charis. It's the same word we get gift from. Your words should be a gift to people because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your life will change when you start speaking life to people. Everybody is having a hard time. Everybody is struggling with something. Everybody needs grace. They need encouragement. They need to be built back up. The world is tearing us down. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, to destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Satan is really good at his threefold job description to steal, to kill, to destroy. Going through life breaks us down. It wears us out. That's why we need to speak life to each other. We need those friends that will build us up, that will be appropriate, that will give us grace, that will help us so much. He goes on after that. Look at what comes next, right after saying unwholesome, corrupt things. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. I've only found three bad things we can do to the Holy Spirit of God. We can grieve the Spirit. We can quench the Spirit. And we can vex the Spirit. Scripture here says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness... Do an inventory here. Bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. We don't use that word a whole lot anymore. I think my definition of that would be wah, 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 wah. Wah, 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 the politicians. Wah, 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 the economy. Wah, 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 the weather. Wah, wah, wah. That it's just negative. It doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't fit the description. It doesn't build you up. It doesn't give you grace. It doesn't fit the occasion. We can do better than that. Get rid of this. Be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another. Christmas is tough to be kind to people because we're jockeying for the same place in life. Traffic is more crowded, and you got to be with your families, and that can be really difficult sometimes, too. So there are a lot of things that can be really tough, so it's a good time to think and plan ahead to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's what Scripture teaches us about words in James, the third chapter. My last point for the day. Words are directional. You can control and you do control where your life goes with your tongue. This is how the Bible describes that. James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers. 
my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. That would be me. Now, this is our last Bible study for the year. I'm leaving you a young man, and I'm coming back next year as an old man. I'm going to be 70. That's a whole new ball game. But we do get a stricter judgment. One thing I realized is I believe we teach what we need to learn. Now, being a psychologist and a minister, I don't know that that would indict anybody more than me. I'm trying to learn how to get along with God. I'm trying to learn how to be human. That's what I need to learn. That's why I teach it. You might remember Jimmy Swagger when he was doing his hardest preaching against sexual immorality. He was trying to learn. And we teach what we need to learn shortly thereafter. He was called at the motel with the prostitutes. If you understand this concept that people teach what they need to learn, listen to people when they really fall into that teaching mode. They're trying to convince you. They're trying to show you how something works. Just be aware. That's probably what they're trying to learn. So teachers incur a stricter judgment. Verse 2 for all, we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. Did you catch that? This may be the first hack I've ever thought of in the Bible. This may be the shortest, quickest, fastest way to becoming a perfect man. Jesus said, be perfect as I am perfect. It meant whole and complete in those days. How do you get to be whole and complete? Learn to manage your tongue. That's going to circumvent everything else out there. I think it could be a good biblical hack if there is such a thing. But you can be a perfect man if you do not stumble in what you say. Able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. I'm not really a horse person, not really a cowboy at all, probably because I thought it was the best deal of my life in Colorado, where when I was a teenager, I could go on a five-mile trail ride for just $5. I thought, this is too good of a deal. I got to go. We went at a pace that was horrible. If the horse went slow, you just kind of side to side. If he's galloping, you're kind of up and down. But that was my bottom on the saddle for the next five miles, just bouncing. We went at a speed where I was just bouncing. It was miserable. I hated it. I would have paid another $5, which was a lot of money back in those days. would have paid another $5 just to be able to get off. It was a miserable experience. So I'm not really a horse person, but I think about, I've been close to some of them. They're a little bit scary. They're so muscular. They're so heavy. They're so powerful. And I think about a horse's neck and I think about your neck. You know, I had two men's Bible studies this morning. Most of those guys are forces to be reckoned with. I look at the size of their necks and it would take probably a hundred to 200 human necks to be as big as one horse's neck. It's so strong. And yet with the bridle, small petite ladies can rein that whole horse's head around, bend that neck either direction as they choose. It's very powerful. So you can bridle your tongue. He gives us another, another illustration Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Do you get this? Just as you can control a horse with a bridle, just as you can control a ship, it may be as long as three football fields. They're building them that big now. You can control it with a very small rudder. You can control your life with your tongue. I encourage you, don't steer it in the wrong direction. I think everybody here knows that. 
But more importantly, use your tongue to steer yourself in the right direction. As I'm learning, my memory's not quite what it used to be, and I don't want to forget things. So yesterday, I said, I've got to put two things in my bag because I'm going to deliver them to people that were going to be at church today, and I can't forget those. So I said, I will remember to take those to the chapel. I put them on my desk where I wouldn't miss them. Then I moved them to my bag. Then I put them in my bag. But just saying, I will remember helps me. Dr. Paul Cho, who was pastor of the largest church on the planet, it was in Seoul, Korea. They at one time had 750,000 active members. He wrote two books, more than two books, but the ones I read, the first one was The Fourth Dimension. The second was The Fourth Dimension Part Two, creative titles. So one of the things I read in those books is he kept studying the Bible, and he saw it's always talking about words. It's always talking about the tongue. And he called in the professionals, the doctors, the scientists, the biologists, uh, the anthropologist, he called all these professional people together and said, guys, I need you to teach me what is so significant about the tongue. And one of the things he learned is that the speech center of the brain is a predominant center. And when you say something, it's connected to your entire central nervous system. And that message, what you say, goes through the central nervous system to every cell in your body. So agree with God. A good friend confronted me this week, and she was so sincere, love her to death, incredibly intelligent, very spiritually gifted. But she said, I want you to stop saying you're a recovering Pharisee. And I tried to humor her a little bit. Then I argued with her a little bit. It's like she sees the outside of me. And I'm not nearly the Pharisee I used to be. But I know what goes on on the inside. I know what's in my heart. I'm still recovering. Because I can go from grace-filled to very legalistic. I can get so legalistic. My default mode is let's go back to the law. Let's go back to the rules. Because most of us in America's churches today were trained to focus more on the rules than the relationship with God. More on the law of God than the love of God. And Jesus is making this huge correction. The law and the rules are good but they've been perverted because what God's looking at is what's going on on the inside of you. What are your attitudes? What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? That's why I have to stand my ground and say, no, I'm, I'm still in recovery. I'm doing better. I'm making progress. I'm not the Pharisee I used to be, but I can still default to that if push comes to shove. And I don't want to be that way. I'd like the harder you squeeze me, the more of the fruit of the Spirit will ooze out. Don't test it quite yet, but I'm trying. That's where I'm going. So we look at this. Now, listen to this. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. What's Jesus' kingdom? Righteousness, peace, and joy. What's the tongue? A world, a kingdom of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of a life. There it's powerful, it's defiling, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. and With it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and curses. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? 
Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is what Jesus is saying. Hey, guys, make a choice. You want to be good, you want to be bad. Control your words. Bridle your words. Steer your words. They're powerful. They can be defiling. And they are directional. I'll wrap it up with the tale back from 1929. Two very highly intelligent human beings, both professors at Oxford, very good friends, colleagues. One was J.R.R. Tolkien, a devout believer in Jesus Christ. The other was a guy named C.S. Lewis, a devout atheist given up on God and all that foo-foo weirdness stuff when he was 15 years old. Very successful professors. They were on the Addison Walk. I've walked on it when I was going to school there. Cool place. It's still there to this day. They were walking, and they kept walking until 3 a.m. in the morning. And they came around to faith and religion. And Tolkien said to C.S. Lewis, I just cannot overemphasize the value of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And C.S. Lewis said, I'm a scientific person. I'm rational. I'm logical. If I can't see it, if I can't feel it, if I can't taste it, if I can't touch it, I don't have anything to do with it because it's not real. I'm a realist. We live, we die, we rot. That's the end of it. And Tolkien didn't give up on his good friend. Two brilliant guys. He changed the topic to great literature. He said, don't you just love it when you're reading a great book? You can barely put it down. How does it affect your feelings? He said, oh, it makes me feel so good. It takes me somewhere I've never been before. I love it so much. How do you feel when you're looking at a beautiful work of art? Oh, it lifts me up so much. And music, when you're listening to just some of the finest music on the planet, doesn't it do something And then philosophically, he talked about, have you ever thought that it may not be the thing, but what comes from the thing and where the thing comes from? And they started talking about that. It's going deeper, becoming more philosophical. He comes around, he said, isn't it plausible that just the fact that a baby has hunger is proof that food exists? that a duckling wants to swim. Is that not proof that there's water? And he led him all the way around this cycle of don't you like to feel those things? And you can feel those things, but you can't hang on to them. He said at Christmas time, God from out there somewhere came into this world in the form of Jesus Christ. And that brought truth and love together. And when you have Jesus, you have the source. And not only do you have the feelings of those things that you can you can touch, but you can't hang on to, that are just so wonderful, but you just don't fully understand how to sustain that. With Jesus, you can live that way all the time. You can live in that awe. You can live in that connection. That long walk was the beginning of C.S. Lewis coming to Christ to become one of the most influential Christian authors of all time. That is what Christmas is about. Love and truth came together. That is Jesus. He is love. He is life. He is light. And he is the truth. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free.